So the first lecture of uh, DSP is uh, I'm not going to go over each and every topic, especially from chapter number one, because uh, there is discussion of uh, what is DSP, what are the applications that you can just read easily and understand. What I'm going to do is um, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start with chapter number one and then transition into chapter number two um, for the important. Uh, topic of sampling and quantization from chapter number two most likely we will be covering um, each and every topic in the video lectures as well so as I said you can go over analog versus digital signal what are analog signals versus uh, what are digital signals uh, a lot of stuff I put over here so basically uh, when you go from analog signal to digital signal you go through a um, couple of steps analog signal is first sampled what is sampling you take the analog signal and you pass it through um, analog to digital converter analog to digital converter the first step what it does is it basically grabs the value of the analog signal at certain time instances and those time instances are called sampling time so let's say you have a signal and you want to grab the sample uh, samples uh, means you want to grab the values of that signal at each uh, one millisecond so you're gonna grab it at zero one millisecond two millisecond three millisecond so those um, that those time are basically your sampling time and your sampling uh, time um, what we represent by ts is one millisecond so every one millisecond you are grabbing the value of the signal so after you grab the value of the signal, uh, then the next step is quantization. What is quantization? Uh, so continuous signal uh, has um, infinite number of values between uh, between the its, its lower value and upper value. Let's say if you have uh, a sinusoidal signal uh, with the peak value of five volt, then it will go from five volt to negative five volt, peak to peak, right? and um, you can at any instant of time you can read the value based on the precision of your equipment you can read the value to any number of uh, precision let's say uh, at an instant of time you can read the value 1.257898 whatever so continuous signal basically they are uh, they exist at each instant of time and their value on the y-axis can have infinite precision quantization when you grab a sample of from the continuous signal quantization mean that you are assigning it a value which is not which does not have infinite precision but which is limited by its precision due to the nature of the equipment so for example if you have uh, if you have uh, let's say a 4-bit converter so 4-bit converter means that the digital values that it will be giving out will be 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 1 0 0 1 0 so all the way from 0 0 0 0 to 1 1 1 1 it can give out values uh, 16 values a 4-bit converter now each digital value has its equivalent um, analog value or each digital value has an equivalent value in base 10 now that base 10 value is the quantized value so if you have a 4-bit converter and if the range of the converter if it can convert from 0 to 10 volt then when you divide 10 by 16 that value is basically you can go in that steps only right so an easy example let's say you have only uh, um, four levels you have two bits a two bit converter four level and you your converter can convert values up to 10 volt 0 to 10 volt so when you divide 10 by 4 it's 2.5 that means your converter can only assign values of 0 volt 2.5 volt 5 volt and 7.5 volt only four values so any uh, uh, any continuous value from your analog signal it has to be assigned one of these four numbers so that's the concept of quantization 
uh, so quantized values are in base 10 they are analog values but they have limited precision which is uh, limited because of the nature of your hardware uh, and it's, um, basically it's the nature of how many bits you're using to convert the analog value into digital value so that's the quantization and after you quantized the signal each of these um, base 10 value is converted into digital codes which are of course zeros and ones so for example uh, again take the example of two bits your digital codes for zero can be zero zero for 2.5 volt can be zero one for five volt it will be one zero and for 7.5 volt it will be one one so each of the quantized level is assigned a digital code so that's basically what an ADC do, analog to digital converter. It, it basically grabs the samples, quantize them based on how many bits uh, that ADC have, and then assign a digital code to each sample. And this is a picture that will show you, that is showing you that the same thing. So you have an analog signal, you take the samples of the signal, and sampling, uh, when you take the sample, you can see that the values are 6.5, 3.3, 2.0, 2.5, but when you quantize them, observe that 6.5 is changed into 7, 3.3 is changed into 3, 2.0 is changed into 2, and so on and so forth. So basically, quantized values are not the exact value of the sample, but it, they are the closest value of the sample, which and that, that closeness is based on how many bits you're using, right? So they are using 3 bits. So each of these value is converted into three bits. Seven is converted one one one, three is converted zero zero one one, and so on and so forth. So this is the whole procedure of analog to digital conversion. So this is the basic block diagram of analog to digital converter. Analog signal comes in. Uh, ADC sample the signal and hold the signal. So it holds the sampled point. Uh, until the next point arrive. In the meantime, it converts it, quantize it, assign the digital uh, value to it. So that's called a sample and hold circuit. Uh, and then the quantization happen, it encodes, and the output voltage goes out. So basically, um, it, it is a discrete signal, that is it exists at discrete points in time, but many times, most of the time, we show it as a step signal like this. So we show it as a step signal. So this is the, this is your analog signal, and then each point, each sample of the analog signal is assigned a quantized value, and those quantized value can be connected with sam like sample and hold can be connected to produce a ladder-like signal or a step signal. So make sure you read all of this um, role of digital signal processing. You can see that, you can read it, it's pretty straightforward. And uh, let's see, so I'm not, as I said, I'm not gonna cover each and everything. You can read all of these things. Implementations, what are the basic purpose of DSP, uh, where it is used, select applications. Uh, my idea is basically that we can start with chapter number two which is sampling and quantization so I gave you um, introduction of sampling and quantization and I told you what sampling is now how do you sample a signal in MATLAB and you will be sampling the signal in MATLAB very frequently so you need to know how to do that and it is done very easily uh, I'm giving you a little example over here any signal that you want to sample, for example, this signal I'm sampling with the sampling interval of 0.1 second, and I'm taking 100 samples. So remember in MATLAB, um, on the first sample when you take, the index of that is one. But generally the sample is taken at t is equal to zero. A sampling sample can start at any time, but the index of that sample, generally we assign it to be one. So if sampling is starting at zero, then that's the sample number one, remember. 
sampling um, so let's say 0 0.1 second is your sampling time so the first sample is at 0 the second is at 0 0.1 the third is at 0 0.2 so on and so forth so the sample at 0 is sample 1 sample at 0 0.1 is sample 2 likewise sample at 0 0.2 is sample 3 so if I ask you what will be uh, the value of the sample uh, number 3 to 5 what will be the values of sample numbers 3 to 5 so when you will uh, sample the signal with the interval of 0 0.1 second then sample number 3 the corresponding time is going to be 0 0.2 second right because the first sample is taken at 0 second the second at 0 0.1 the third is 0 0.2 so that sample is going to be taken at 0 0.2 second so you're going to be you're going you're gonna to give me the values of samples with corresponding time of 0 0.2 second, 0 0.3 second, and 0 0.4 second. That would be samples 3, 4, and 5. Okay, so make sure you understand this. Okay, uh, let's see. And uh, in MATLAB or Octave, uh, I'm showing you a, a small program as how you're gonna do that. So look at that. Um, I wanna grab 100 samples starting at 0 to 99. Um, sampling time is 0 0.1. I multiply n and ts to produce the time um, at uh, the instant, the time instances at, uh, at which each sample is going to be taken. And then I go ahead and write the equation. Make sure that it is an array operation. So you use uh, t is a vector. So you use the period, uh, a period before any power sign, any multiplication between the two vectors, and any division of the vector. You don't have to use period if you are multiplying a constant by a vector. Okay, so remember that that you learn in different classes, including the uh, software class. Okay, so when you are performing sampling, um, sampling has to be performed um, with a specific rate, uh, which we call sampling rate. Now, that rate, uh, the the choice of that rate has a condition. And that condition is called sam uh, Shannon sampling theorem. So, if a signal is given to you, uh, and the signal has uh, frequencies, multiple frequencies, you look at the highest frequency in the signal. If a signal has only one frequency, of course, that's the highest frequency. But if um, the signal has multiple frequencies, like your voice, voice signal goes generally from 300 hertz to 3.3 hertz. So, 3.3 hertz in that case is going to be the highest frequency. So you look at the signal, time domain signal, that what is the highest frequency of that signal. And um, according to the Shannon's sampling theorem, you have to sample that signal by at least twice the amount of the highest frequency. So the sampling frequency of that signal should be at least two times the highest frequency in the signal if you want to recover that signal from its samples that condition two times the highest frequency is called Nyquist rate Nyquist rate so if a signal is sampled at least with the Nyquist rate you can theoretically recover the signal we will see shortly the theoretical and practical aspect so you can theoretically recover the signal from its sample but if it is not if it is sampled with a rate less than the Nyquist rate you cannot recover the signal because there is a noise called alias aliasing noise that interfere with the sample and destroy the shape of the signal so we will see that shortly so remember Nyquist rate is what twice the amount of the highest frequency in the time to end signal and generally practical for practical purpose the sampling is done at a rate which is higher than the Nyquist rate uh, so for example the voice signal is generally sampled at 8 kilohertz. Although voice highest frequency is um, 3.3 kilohertz, Nyquist rate will be twice of that, 6.6 .6 kilohertz. But generally, the sampling is done at 8 kilohertz. And why? You will see it shortly. Okay. So from the sampling rate or sampling frequency, you can calculate the sampling time. So if sampling frequency is 8 kilohertz then sampling time is going to be 1 over 8 kilohertz and that sampling time you can use in MATLAB again to calculate the samples so based on um, the rate at which the signal is sampled 
you can have three sampling conditions. You can either undersample a signal, which is not recommended, if the sampling rate is less than the Nyquist rate. You oversample the signal, which is mostly what we do in practical um, situations. Uh, that is, your sampling rate, sampling frequency is greater than the Nyquist rate. And you can critically sample a signal, that is, your sampling frequency is exactly the same as Nyquist rate. I, uh, under ideal condition or under theoretical condition, it's okay to have critical sampling. Under practical conditions, uh, we do not want the, the, to sample the signal with critical sampling. Why? You will see it shortly. Okay, make sure you read all of this. Um, so, to understand why, um, uh, to understand how we can recover the signal from its sample. Uh, assume that when you're sampling, um, a signal is coming in and you're turning the signal on and off. So when the signal turn, when you turn the switch on, the at that instance, the signal will pass through. And when you open the switch, of course, the signal is not gonna pass through. So basically, you are switching, you're turning on and off the switch at the sampling instances, right? This is the switch we are talking about. And uh, each time the switch turns on, signal is gonna go to the ADC, and then um, the switch is gonna turn back off, that is it will turn open, and during the time it is off, no signal is gonna go through ADC, and ADC is going to convert the signal that it uh, received uh, at the sampling instance, first it's gonna quantize it, and then it's gonna convert into a digital domain. Um, so when we do this, and uh, we are not going into any derivation, but what is the effect of that into frequency domain? So let's assume that X of F is the frequency spectrum of the original signal. So we write like this, X of T is, uh, X of T corresponds to X of F. That is X of T is the time domain signal and its frequency spectrum is x of f which shows what frequencies are including in uh, included in x of t so when you sample x of t uh, sampling spectrum we call it x of s f because the sample signal we are calling x of s t sampling spectrum basically uh, looks like x of f but it repeats itself so it's x of f, let's say x of x was something like this, right? This is, the, this is frequency f and this is x of f. So let's say x of f some, uh, looks something like this in the, uh, uh, in the frequency domain. So when you sample the signal, basically the spectrum of the sampled signal is going to have the original spectrum at center at f is equal to zero magnitude of that spectrum is going to be scaled by 1 over t. 1 over, one over t is 1 over t, yes, sorry. This, I, I just grabbed this from the book. They're using 1 over t. Use 1 over t, yes, because t we usually use for time period. t, yes, we use for uh, sampling time. So this is actually sampling time, not the time period. So the, the magnitude of this signal, let's say the original magnitude was a, then the magnitude of the sampled signal is going to be scaled by 1 over t and it's going to become a over t s. And then this spectrum, original spectrum, is going to be repeated at each f is equal to f s, f s minus f s, uh, 2 f s minus 2 f s, and so on, so on and so forth. So this thing is going to be centered at each of this frequency. That's what this says, xf minus nfs, where n goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. So whenever you see this, that means the signal x, which is the spectrum of the original signal, it exists, it is centered every time at any frequency when this becomes zero. So any frequency at which the argument of x becomes zero, it is going to be centered at that frequency. So f, when f is equal to, let's say n is equal to one, 
when f is equal to fs then this signal original signal is going to be centered at fs so this is going to be centered over here right here exactly the same shape of course i'm you know i'm not making exact shape because my pen uh, pen tablet pen is not very accurate but it's going to be exactly the same shape but it's going to be centered at fs likewise when you take f is equal to negative fs then it is going to be centered so let's say uh, n is negative 1 right so that is going to become f plus fs this thing f plus fs so when you take f is equal to negative fs the argument is going to become 0 that means x is going to be centered at that frequency at negative fs right right here so you will see that original signal is going to be original spectrum is going to be repeated infinite number of times if you sample that signal if you sample that time domain signal with some sampling frequency fs the original spectrum is going to be repeated itself in the in the frequency domain for infinite number of time and each instance of the spectrum will be centered at the sampling frequency two times sampling frequency three times sampling frequency in the positive uh, sampling uh, positive frequency and the same thing in the negative frequency domain although practically negative frequencies do not exist but when we are dealing with the spectrum uh, then we show the sampling frequencies so this is explained on this page over here and this is an example that i basically i was showing you another spectrum but this is an example with the triangular spectrum so in this spectrum is a triangle uh, this is called the bandwidth or cutoff frequency so bandwidth is from zero to b again bandwidth is only assumed in the positive side uh, and bandwidth means the band of frequencies that belong to the signal so for voice the bandwidth is 3.3 kilohertz it has frequencies up to 3.3 kilohertz so the bandwidth of the voice signal is 3.3 uh, kilohertz or if you if you take if you take the band width from uh, 300 hertz to 3.3 kilohertz then the bandwidth will be 3.3 kilohertz minus 300 hertz but generally we take it from zero so we say that voice signal bandwidth is from zero hertz to 3.3 hertz okay now uh, when you sample the signal of course then you will be repeating the signal you have multiple instances of the signal as i discussed with you and observe that this signal is oversampled so between each instant instance you have some frequency at which there is no signal and this is extremely important when you are recovering the original signal back using filters so this is the example of oversampling of the signal where sampling frequency is greater than the nyquist rate again read all those things and uh, uh, let's go and show you what's going to happen when you critically sample the signal when you critically sample the signal your uh, sampling frequency is equal to the nyquist rate and your your uh, in each instance of a spectrum is going to be adjacent with each other right and again read it will make perfect sense to you that why it is adjacent with each other it is very easy because again remember your sampling frequency is twice the rate of what highest frequency in the original signal here the highest frequency is b so fs is 2b right so this point is two times b and when you center this spectrum original spectrum here then it's going to go from b to 3b right because the width of the spectrum is from negative b to positive b so it will be adjacent it will be connected to the previous spectrum and to the next spectrum right so that's the critical sampling now if you do under sampling then the the next is the instance of a spectrum or the adjacent is, is, uh, instance of a spectrum is going to leak into the adjacent spectrum so both spectrums or both instances of a spectrum or every instance of a spectrum which is adjacent uh, to each other is going to be leaking uh, into the other spectrum and when the when this leak happens 
then basically you lose the shape of the original spectrum. So observe that here you are keeping the shape of the original spectrum. In oversampling, you are keeping the shape of the original spectrum. But when undersampling is done, then you lose the shape of the original spectrum because the adjacent the frequencies from the adjacent instance, it they leak into the original spectrum. And this leakage of frequency is called aliasing noise. So anytime undersampling happens, you have aliasing noise. And the, the whole phenomena is called aliasing. Okay, so how does this affect of recovering the signal? So when you have uh, oversampled signal, you have a space between the adjacent uh, instances of a spectrum. You can use a practical low pass filter and extract the original spectrum. Right, this is the original spectrum. So you can easily use because you have a lot of room between the adjacent instance and in, uh, instances. You can use a practical low pass filter and extract the original spectrum. Of course, this is spectrum. Um, the only thing that is different is that it is scaled to one over TS. Right, but that scaling doesn't really matter as long as the shape of the spectrum is same. It's uh, time doing signal is going to be the same. The only thing is going to be time domain signal will have uh, different um, strength and that strength can be recovered by using amplification or by limiting if the strength is more by limiting uh, by the use of limiters. But as long as you have the same shape of the spectrum, it has the same frequencies uh, with the same uh, up and downs, uh, then you your time domain signal will be exactly the same only the uh, uh, strength of the signal will be different that can be recovered or adjusted so for oversampled signal you can easily recover the original spectrum let's go to the critically sampled signal so for critically sampled signal you can still use ideal low pass filter remember ideal low pass filter they do not exist in uh, practice but as far as theory is concerned, you can still use ideal low pass filter. That is, um, the ideal low pass filter is the, the cutoff frequency is uh, in an in instant instead of going like this. Instead of going like this, they go like this. The cutoff frequency is straight up. So they are like a box. And anything within that box, they grab it. So you can still use ideal low pass filter and you can uh, grab the signal. Even if you want to use a uh, practical low pass filter, it's still a, a little possibility as I showed you. It can go up like this and then down like this for the practical low pass filter. But it's not that easy to create a practical low pass filter such that you can end it exactly at negative P and positive P. It will generally, generally the shape of the practical low pass filter is something like this. So it will leak over to the next instance because they are adjacent to each other. But at least, at least ideally you can still recover the original spectrum, hence you can recover the signal. But if you go to under sample signal because the adjacent frequencies has leaked into the original spectrum, your even ideal low pass filter cannot recover all the original frequencies right and that's the reason that uh, you cannot recover the signal if under sampling is done so these frequencies fs minus b right here these frequencies are called aliasing frequencies right here this these frequencies right here these are called aliasing frequencies or aliasing noise uh, I have put a uh, few examples, go over these examples. The one I want to show you uh, is uh, the cosine signal. Cosine signal is, uh, or sinusoidal signal is a very common signal uh, when you are doing the sampling. Now, when you have a cosine signal, the spectrum of the cosine signal is represented by this. So if the magnitude of cosine signal is A, the frequency of the cosine signal is F0, then the spectrum is A over 2, uh, delta F minus F naught plus delta F plus F naught. What is delta F minus F? What is the delta signal? Uh, most of you are familiar with the impulse. Delta is the impulse signal, right? What is impulse signal? Impulse signal basically 
is a signal that happens only at one instant of time or frequency and uh, for analog signal impulse signal has infinite magnitude and it exists only at one instant of time um, and uh, the area under the impulse signal is one in digital domain we take the impulse signal as again the signal that exists only at one instant of time or frequency and the magnitude of the signal is one or whatever it is multiplied with so a by two for example so the magnitude of this will be a by two and it exists at only one instant of time or frequency and at that instant is when the argument of the impulse becomes zero so for this for example this f minus f naught the argument is going to become zero when f is equal to f naught so this signal is going to exist at f naught and likewise f plus f naught when f is negative f naught then the argument is going to become zero and this impulse will exist at negative f naught so you have a positive f naught and then you have let's say this is zero then you have a negative f naught so this will be the spectrum of a cosine signal two impulses one at positive f naught one at negative f naught the magnitude of the impulses are a by two so that's a cosine signal uh, spectrum uh, every sine or cosine signal it has only one frequency right whatever the frequency of that signal is so in the frequency domain when you look uh, on the spectrometer you will only see one impulse at that frequency because it does not have any other frequency as simple as that okay so the, in this example i think we are sampling uh, the the cosine signal uh, not sure what is the sampling rate i took uh, 15 hertz so we are sampling it with 15 hertz uh, observe that the frequency of this cosine signal remember this is uh, this is 10 pi t 10 pi t means omega t omega t is 10 pi t and omega is 2 pi f right so f is going to be 5 5 hertz right 2 pi f is 10 pi so 2 f is 10 so f is going to be 5 hertz so the frequency of this cosine signal is 5 hertz we are sampling it with 15 hertz that means we are over sampling it uh, Nyquist rate is going to be 10 hertz so we are over sampling it and then this is the original spectrum as i uh, just discussed with you over here the magnitude of the spectrum since the magnitude of the sine sig cosine signal is 2 so a by 2 is going to be 1 so magnitude of each impulse is 1 and each impulse exists at f minus f naught that is f naught is 5 and f plus f naught that is negative 5. This is the spectrum of the original signal. So when you sample the signal with 15 hertz, remember what does sampling do? It repeats the signal and it uh, center the original spectrum at each uh, f, sample fre f sampling frequency. So you're going to take this and you're going to center it at 15 hertz, negative 15 hertz, uh, 30 hertz, negative 30 hertz, and so on and so forth. So when you sample it, this will be the equation for the sampled signal from 15 hertz to negative 15 hertz. That's what I'm asking you, uh, or sorry, uh, 20 hertz to negative 20 hertz. That's what I'm asking you that just go up to that limit. Otherwise, remember, sampling will produce infinite number of impulses because sampling produce infinite instances of the original spectrum so this will be the signal uh, sample signal in the uh, frequency domain you have the original spectrum only scaled by 1 over ts right this is the original spectrum scaled by 1 over ts this is the spectrum which is centered at 15 hertz which is fs and this is the spectrum which is centered at the same spectrum but centered at negative fs or negative 15 hertz and again remember this will keep on going the next is gonna be centered at 30 hertz to fs and over here negative 30 hertz right So this will be the spectrum of the signal 
in example 2.3 uh, the same signal uh, or not the same signal sorry uh, I'm taking this signal it is comprised of two cosine waveforms one has a frequency of 2000 Hertz 4000 pi means 2000 Hertz and one has a frequency of 5000 Hertz 10,000 pi 5000 Hertz magnitude are 10 and 6 so you can see that um, this is the original spectrum right here and then if it is under sampled and check out the sampling rate is 8 kilohertz now uh, it is under sampled because your highest frequency is 5000 hertz that means Nyquist rate is 10,000 hertz uh, and you are sampling the signal at 8000 hertz that means it is under sampled and what will it will be under sampled this is going to be the spectrum that will be produced again look at it and draw it yourself understand it try to understand it and then in this you will see the aliasing noise uh, which will basically which is seeping into the original spectrum so do this problem try to understand it I'm, I'm explaining uh, everything over here go over those things but draw the spectrum yourself don't just read it draw the spectrum yourself because if I ask you a question like this in the quiz or the exam you will have to draw the spectrum of course uh, so work on that try to understand it and again if you have any question then uh